Our next speaker, um, I'm very excited to present. We were very disappointed because um, Dr. Wilson was unable to get his flight here on time yesterday, but he is here this morning. And thank you to Jennifer Penagulius for switching her talk to go yesterday so he can speak to us today. Uh, Dr. Jim Wilson is a professor in the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, where he has led an effort to develop the field of gene therapy. He really doesn't need much of an introduction, but I feel obligated to just do it, so stick with me. Um, he essentially has um, developed gene therapy for rare monogenetic disorders. Um, his lab essentially discovered the AAV vector for uh, gene transfer, and I think that's pretty incredible. He's been around for um, decades really trying to make his life work so that people living with monogenetic disorders can see transformative treatments in their lifetime. And he's been part of the roller coaster of the ups and downs of gene therapy and has come and allowed us to come an incredibly long way. And he's really been committed to Angelman syndrome since 2016, obviously for decades before with other diseases, including cystic fibrosis, who's with us today. So I think we're all um, come full circle to have both of you in the room together because when I met Jim, I, I emailed him out of the blue um, after I learned when someone stood up at a, a conference that I was watching on TV that he was cured of cystic fibrosis because of gene therapy. And I was like, who's curing anything with gene therapy? And I Googled and I found um, through a press release that it was Dr. Jim Wilson that started his work in gene therapy for cystic fibrosis. And I just gave him a random blind email and he wrote me back within 12 minutes. And then we started chatting and got him interested in Angelman and, and here we are. So it is really exciting for him to be able to share with you where we are today compared to where we were in 2016. So he's gonna to speak to us about the human UBE3A AAV9 gene replacement therapy program for Angelman syndrome, progress toward the clinic. Thank you, Jim. Great, can everyone hear me? They mic me up here. In the back, everyone can hear me? Great. I, just a uh, clarification, so I was on a plane that started to shake a lot and we turned around and came back to Philadelphia and what, what I thought was an, an incredibly insightful comment from the pilot is when he said, it's better to be on the ground wishing you were in the air than in the air wishing you were on the ground. <laughs> so he was trying to rationalize why my flights got all messed up, but I, I, I thought that was one moment in my life uh, that that was probably true. Um, so um, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna talk to you about um, so the work that we've been doing in gene therapy for Angelman syndrome, but I want to put it in some context because I've, I've heard, uh, uh, and, and you probably read in the press about the status of gene therapy. So I'm, I'm going to be direct, you can quote me, that the science of gene therapy couldn't and hasn't been any better uh, than it is now. The, we continue to make incredible progress in the technical and clinical development of gene therapy. But for some reason, investors have decided that it's not investable for reasons that I don't completely understand. But one of it is that uh, it's hard to make a lot of money when you cure a disease with a one-time injection. So, well, I guess if that's the case, then we're gonna have to rely on organizations such as FAST that have a different perspective on how they want to invest their money. But, um, but the news that is coming out on, on gene therapy and, 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 and other diseases is uh, something that I dreamed about 30 to 40 years ago. So we have to make sure that we keep our eye on the target for Angelman syndrome and I think try to benefit from the lessons learned from other diseases. And I think we're at that point and I wanna share with you what we're thinking today about, uh, about that. So these are the acknowledgments of uh, the people in our group past and current uh, scientists, as well as the collaboration that we had with Amicus. So um, as we think about developing gene therapy for any monogenic disease, uh, we do this in stages. First, we conduct studies and animal models of the disease to determine whether we can show that this is potentially effective. Uh, realizing that those models are not humans and they have their limitations. They're usually mice. What I have shown down at the bottom uh, is a picture of a mouse brain, which will become relevant when we then move to the next stage of testing, which are non-human primates to evaluate the uh, intervention or the vector or the gene therapy 
for safety and dosing. And this just shows that one of the challenges is to try to mimic the delivery of the biologic in a larger brain uh, versus that of a smaller brain, in which it's a lot easier to get vector into a small, uh, small brain. And then humans, where we uh, first in human studies to evaluate safety, and then to try to get some idea, are we engaging in the target, and are we um, um, achieving what we want to achieve short of a full-on clinical um, uh, endpoint, which may be complicated with smaller diseases. So Inter Verma, who, uh, who I got to know when I started this, my journey 40 years ago, again, succinctly put that the major challenges to gene therapy are delivery, delivery, and delivery. So apparently delivery is an issue. But I wanted to talk about uh, what it means in terms of delivery. So uh, what I've shown here are two different routes of administration that are being used to treat CNS diseases, uh, disease of the spinal cord in the brain. One is an intravenous delivery, and this is a basis for an approved product called Zolgensma that's essentially changing uh, the landscape for patients born with spinal muscular atrophy type 1. The challenge with that approach, however, is the vector has to get across barriers. So one other approach to try to uh, overcome the barrier of the blood in the brain is to inject the vector into the cerebral spinal fluid, which is something that our team has popularized um, and for which we have a lot of experience. You can either do it in the lumbar space or closer to the brain in what's called the cisterna magna. But then once we overcome the physical barrier of getting there, it's got to get in the cell, and this is basically a biology 101 of all the different steps that are necessary to get in the cell and, and for it to be expressed. The biggest challenge is not getting it into the cell once it's to the cell, it's getting it to the cell because of these physical barriers. So uh, the work that actually a graduate student did many, many years ago as part of his PhD was to determine what is the best route of administration to get the broadest distribution throughout the brain uh, realizing that many diseases require uh, to treat a global uh, neurologic disease vector to be uh, uh, access to many cells of the brain. And again, this is a, a picture of what the procedure would be to inject a vector into the cisterna magna. So in, in this uh, data set, which came from Ron Crystal's lab, um, what we've done is, what he's done, is to trace the distribution of the injected vector uh, following a cisterna ma uh, magna injection in a monkey. And, and then it's followed over time, one hour, 24, uh, 48, and 72 hours. And it turns out that injecting the vector into the cisterna magna is actually effective at getting broad distribution in the region of the brain and then down the spinal cord over time. And very little, although some, leaks out of the central nervous system. Now, how does this then translate to what's important? And that's not only getting close to the cell, but getting in the cell and expressing a gene. And so these are uh, monkeys, again, in which we injected a vector and then analyzed not only where the vector went, but did it express a gene, which is something that turns the cell green. Uh, and this is in the cortex, hippocampus, and the cerebellum. And when you, whenever you see spots of green, that means the cell has taken the gene up and it's expressing it. But it's not completely all green, which means we can achieve some level of gene transfer throughout the brain, but it's not 100%. So if our disease needs 100% of cells corrected, this may not be ready yet for prime time. We often don't know the answer to that question, actually. So one other point about safety, because our lab has sort of been uh, self-proclaimed safety cops. So we try to pay exquisite attention to toxicity. And one, uh, one area of potential toxicity that we discovered when we started to inject vectors into non-human primates into the cerebral spinal fluid uh, had to do with uh, uh, a potential toxicity in a nerve called the dorsal root ganglia. And, and what this is, is that uh, this captures the cell bodies of a nerve that extends up the spinal cord, but importantly, peripherally in peripheral nerves. And what 
Juliet Hordeau had discovered in the first toxicology experiment that we conducted uh, using this approach with uh, an AV9 vector was that uh, a few, only a minor subpopulation of cells seemed uh, to undergo degeneration that is then manifested in a loss of the axon both up the spinal cord and, and in the periphery. Um, now we've now studied this in 220 monkeys. So we wanted in various different programs and, and only less than 1% did the monkeys have any symptoms but when they did, it was something related to a peripheral nerve uh, manifestation such as, it's hard to know what the monkey's feeling but they had trouble with some coordination and, and, and possibly what's called uh, neur uh, neuralgia or, or pain. And that was when the, when the gene product was particularly immunogenic. And in humans, uh, vectors have been delivered in this route. And there are, there are two cases uh, possibly where there was manifestation of this in humans uh, in which there was uh, self-limited uh, pain along, along the, ner uh, the particular peripheral nerve. So it's an important part of evaluating safety for this program to do experiments in monkeys and ask the question, uh, is there evidence for toxicity uh, in the dorsal root ganglia, which is something that we did. Um, and, and we believe that the, the, the reason for this safety concern has to do with the fact that these sensory neurons are exquisitely uh, well positioned to take up vector. And they take up a, a lot of vector and sometimes uh, depending on what the gene product is, that gene product may be expressed at levels that the cell can't tolerate. And then those few cells that get a lot of vector degenerate. And for a period of time, they're inflamed. But again, we've uh, evaluated this in many programs and, um, and we can do histology in monkeys uh, to try to determine which ones that are a higher risk because it's very much dependent on, on the transgene. So uh, I wanna share with you a series of uh, clinical trials that, we are, that are underway that use the same approach that we plan to use for Angelman syndrome um, and try to um, share with you what some of the uh, uh, similarities are and maybe what some of the differences are because our goal is to learn from those experiences to assure that when we move into the clinic, we can do this with uh, the utmost attention to safety and the highest chance of success. So these are diseases that are due to an enzyme defect that's secreted. They're called lysomal storage diseases. So if you can bear with me on this illustration that I proudly made myself, so it's, it's probably not that aesthetic, but hopefully as content, is, um, that the enzyme deficient cell is blue and the enzyme normal cell is orange. And when you inject a vector into the brain, we can't get the gene into all of the neurons. Um, but we can get them in some. Now in these particular category of diseases that are called lysomal storage diseases, uh, that, they, they are, uh, that the gene will express an enzyme that is secreted and when it is secreted, it can be taken up by an adjacent cell or influence the adjacent cell so that, um, so that that cell then is no longer blue, that cell is orange. So that by achieving gene transfer in a subset of cells, we can affect uh, a larger population of cells. So we now are enrolling or in clinical trials for seven different lysomal storage diseases in the context of two companies uh, that I started. Um, and I want to just share with you sort of the lead program uh, because we're going to use the same vector, same approach for Angelman, but a different biology. And this is a disease called uh, MPS2 uh, or Hunter syndrome. And, and the structure of the trial is that, uh, that patients which are children less than uh, between four months of age and five years of age, re receive a single dose of vector into the cisterna magna. And then um, in three different cohorts, a low dose, a mid dose, and a high dose. And then followed over time for clinical development endpoints 
and also biomarker endpoints, and they're very good biomarkers in these diseases. This just shows the results in this study, which is being conducted by, by Regenix Bio, um, of uh, a, a measure, uh, a, a metabolite in the cerebral spinal fluid that is believed to be predictive of disease. So when it's high, uh, there's more disease, and when it's low, there's less disease in uh, uh, potentially achieving normal levels. And so this is an average of, um, of three patients per group. And I'll just point out the highest dose where there's a precipitous drop in this pathologic biomarker and then into normal range and it's stable. And actually, uh, Regenix Bio has gone to the FDA and they've requested potential approval for this product based on this reduction in endpoint and something called accelerated approval, which is a, it's a huge advance for this disease and it's something that, that it would be useful to try to develop biomarkers so that we may not have to rely solely on clinical endpoints. In terms of clinical uh, progression of these diseases of, in this trial, it, it, it takes longer than measure, measuring biomarkers, but these are the normal trajectory of development of children in terms of cognition, expressive language, and fine motor skills. And what they've learned is that their stabilization of disease when the kids had progressed, but if you can introduce the gene early because this is a degenerative disease, they follow the normal trajectory. And uh, it'll be very interesting to follow this over time. So what about Angelman syndrome? Uh, well, until recently, I, I felt uh, well, I quite frankly didn't know, and still I don't, I don't know, and maybe some others do, whether we need to get the gene in all the neurons in all parts of the brain or not. Um, but there, was, uh, there is another way to think about that and ask the question, is it possible to achieve cross-correction in, uh, in Angelman syndrome? But again, conventional wisdom here is this is not an enzyme deficient Gene, it's UB3A, would be uh, deficient. Normal would be, again, orange. Again, we suspect we can get genes into some, but not all of the neurons, many of them. And if there um, is not cross-correction, then the, the remedy would be limited to the cells that receive the gene. And the question is, Will that impact on physiology or impact on, on, on adjacent cells or not? Um, just to get back to our, our gene therapy strategy, we have a clinical candidate vector that is the same kind of vector used in the Zolgensma trial and also um, in all those seven uh, lysosomal storage disease trials. And we've completed several phases of development of this product. And I'll wrap that up at the end. One is to evaluate the pharmacology. Is it possible that in the mouse model, when we administer the vector into the CNS, into the cerebral spinal fluid, can we demonstrate some level of correction of the phenotype in the mouse? And you all become quite experts in these animal models. But uh, looking at motor function, activity, um, uh, also uh, marble bearing, which is a complex behavior, and then uh, nest building. We also look at gait. So our initial studies was to introduce into our AV vectors the isoform 1, 2, and 3, and ask the question, which should we use? Because it's complicated to use uh, to develop a therapy for all three. Um, and the experiment was to inject into the cerebral spinal fluid as best as we could simulate a cisterna magna injection, uh, a vector uh, that expressed either one of these isoforms, and then subsequently followed them over time to evaluate any uh, correction or improvement in these abnormalities. And we settled on, on isoform 1 in part based on some of these data in which um, we've evaluated some of these readouts as a function of dose, and you usually are more confident that it's a, a response to your product when you see a dose response. Uh, but in looking at uh, longer, at, at basically uh, longer stride length or um, 
any evidence for abnormalities in gait. We showed an improvement in isoform 1. We did not in hypoactivity, uh, but nest building at both doses and then uh, motor um, coordination, um, we showed it at a higher dose. So it was really based on these and a, and a variety of other data that we've decided to proceed forward with isoform 1 and an AV9 like vector. Then we moved to non human primates, um, uh, taking the same approach we have with many, many other programs in the interest of sternum magna injection. Uh, and then we followed the animals clinically, uh, evidence for uptake of the gene, expression of the gene, and then also is there evidence, any evidence for this DRG pathology? Uh, this is the vector biodistribution uh, in various different organs uh, of the brain. And what we have on the y-axis, this is a log plot, uh, but it measures how many vector genomes there are per cell. So one would be, on average, one vector genome per cell, where 0.1 would be 10%. One thing we've learned is that the distribution of the vector, at least um, as measured by the vector genome, is really quite, um, it's, it's quite efficient. Now, the question is, does this mean that all cells have one genome, or do some cells have more than one genome? And we have done some single cell studies, and it looks like it's wi more widely distributed than we had otherwise thought, which is, which, is a, uh, which is a good fact. And then we evaluated some of these tissues for expression of the vector RNA, which we can't look at absolute levels, but uh, showed expression um, throughout the tissues that the vector distributed to. But importantly, safety. So in these non-human primates, we scored their DRG tissues for any evidence of pathology uh, as at the cervical region, the thoracic, and the lumbar region. And I'll say that this is the cleanest monkey study out of all the 250 monkeys that we've done. So um, really encouraged by what the safety of this product would be potentially um, the safest one that we brought into the clinic. So the question is, can we actually achieve cross-correction with UB3A? And we were working with Amicus uh, over the last two years based on some work done by the community here about the potential to actually engineer uh, the UB3A in a way that it could be secreted and taken up by another cell, adjacent cell, to achieve kind of like a lysosomal storage disease approach for Angelman syndrome. It came upon uh, an interesting finding. So again, uh, let's go back to uh, what we're proposing here is that uh, UB3A, maybe that model isn't uh, correct or that we can engineer a gene to simulate what we are, are trying to achieve in lysosomal storage diseases in which we get the vector into some a few, uh, a subset of cells, but then that vector somehow expresses UB3A or some uh, consequence of UB3A that benefits the adjacent cells and that we achieve a global effect despite the fact we don't get the gene in all of the cells. So uh, the work that uh, we undertook really was based on presentations that I heard at this meeting over several years is to actually engineer, and this is with Amicus, versions of the normal uh, gene that have components uh, that may facilitate secretion and uptake. And we evaluated a variety of these. Um, and um, first what we did is we produced the protein itself and put these on cells and then asked the question, do those cells now have UB3A activity based on an E3 ligase activity assay that they didn't have before? And do they take up the protein and localize the protein for where you want it to be? So this was isoform 1. And there were two or three of these fusion proteins that actually achieved some level of localization um, into the nucleus, whereas where we want it, although there's some cytoplasmic activity and cellular activity for E3 ligase. So we were encouraged by that, but we wanted to study this in vivo. And so we made vectors either expressing um, an untagged gene here, 
or uh, one with one of our, uh, we did this with multiple fusion proteins, injected the vector into the brain of mice, uh, and then studied the animals for expression of the protein. And this is the control, which is wild type, where we see the brown staining where the normal protein is from the mouse, and then the, uh, the animal model where we have uh, very little protein. So we could express it with our vector, which wasn't a surprise. But then we asked the question, is there evidence in vivo for cells that uh, express this fusion protein where they have to have gene, RNA, and protein and secrete it and have it taken up by an adjacent cell where that adjacent cell should not have RNA, it should only have the protein. These are incredibly elegant uh, uh, studies of uh, animals injected with this vector, such as I showed before. So, so let me just walk you through this. Um, so gray here are cell nuclei that are not, there, there isn't RNA, UB3 RNA from the vector or protein. Um, and, and so that would be no expression. We, we, we have a few cells that are red, you can see here, that uh, only have RNA and, and not protein. And I think that's because our assay for the RNA is much more sensitive than the protein. But then what's really interesting, oh, and then, and then there are the, the typical cells that are purple that have the RNA and the protein. That means they've taken the vector up and they're expressing the protein. But then we have some cells that are green only, and those are cells that don't have the gene and have the protein. So that would suggest that that maybe, um, you know, that we've been able to achieve with these fusion proteins, the secretion of protein that could then be taken up by an adjacent cell. And again, we're not the ones that developed this. Uh, some really important work that came out of this community, but we're trying to adapt it to AV gene therapy. So in typical in science, when you think you know what you're doing, you learn that you really don't know what you're doing, and biology is always more complicated than you think. So then we actually quantified um, the percent of cells for which there's cross-correction here. That's the, that's the number of green cells. Where we looked at two of our fusion proteins that had these moieties that allowed secretion and uptake. But our control vector, that was supposed to be a negative control vector, which is a vector that expre expresses a wild type isoform 1 UB3A, actually demonstrates cross-correction. So, this is now uh, an emerging story. Is it possible that, that the UB3A uh, uh, is expressed or secreted from cells and can function in a paracrine way, uh, affecting the broader uh, biology of the brain? So, so this then adds the element, interesting element, that it is possible if this secreted wild-type protein has function in adjacent cells that we may be able to achieve results uh, beyond that of the cell that takes the gene up. So, so where are we right now? Um, well, we're committed to our clinical candidate, um, and uh, we are uh, uh, finished the studies that I just mentioned to you, moving to uh, preparing for meetings with health authorities in Europe and the United States. Uh, we will be reaching out and are reaching out to the community to help uh, in providing input on the clinical trial design, which we still uh, is a work in progress. Um, we have um, scheduled, we've uh, in the process of developing the assays to support the manufacturing. We have a contract manufacturing organization that we've made vector for clinical trials in the past. Uh, we're scheduling that. Uh, and as soon as we have our um, meeting with health authorities, uh, we will then begin the, uh, the final animal studies, the IND enabling studies, while we're producing vectors so that we could initiate first in human studies. So um, I guess what I would say is, you know, in summary, um, as, as you think about gene therapy for rare diseases, um, uh, I've never been more excited in, in my career, and I've been doing this for a while, about, about what the potential is. You know, with that said, uh, like any emerging technology, um, this still, these are experiments. Although I think where we position this program in the broader enterprise of Wilson, Inc., I guess you'd call it, um, that, 
you're benefiting from enormous experience we have taking this approach so that when we bring it into the clinic, we can do it with as much confidence as anyone can do to assure safety and then um, evaluate whether it works. And we're going to lean very heavily on stakeholders here uh, to uh, develop approaches such as biomarkers and other readouts so that when we do that experiment, we not only know it's safe, but that there's some sense that it's working. And the incredible story around the ASOs, when I read that, I just said, wow, uh, you know, again, when you think you know everything, maybe there would be the potential that you would see with a limited number of subjects uh, a result. Um, so again, thanks for your patience. Thanks for the for uh, Allison for working around this uh, travel uh, snafu. And I guess uh, I think we may be out of time, but maybe a minute or two, and I'll be part of the uh, uh, panel. Thank you very much. Want to we take one or two questions? Back here. I thought I saw you first, Nicole. Hi, great talk. I was just wondering, um, when you were looking at the cells uh, labeled for the vector and the protein, at what point were you looking at them? And if you looked at it over like a longitudinal period of time? Yeah, the, um, it's, it's a good question. And I think it speaks to durability of the effect. Um, and so in, in these experiments, for the, for the time that we've evaluated them, which has been less than a year, it's been stable. The longest we followed any preclinical model for expression of an AV vector such as this uh, has been in, the, in the, one of the MPS programs. We followed this in monkeys up to five years, and it was stable for five years. So maybe a simple question and probably not a simple answer, but why can't you get the genes into all the cells? Yeah, it is, um, it is an important question. And, um, and I, I think that uh, it, it's the delivery. So when you inject a vector into the blood, it's got to cross the blood-brain barrier. Um, and uh, if we had a completely permeable blood-brain barrier, we could achieve that. But, but, but that wouldn't be safe. Um, it, it's really that physical. Barrier. Now, in terms of the cerebral spinal fluid, you do get uh, more access to cells. And there are things that you can do in how you inject it to get a broader distribution. And, um, and there are, we've tried to optimize that as much as we can. The other, the other problem is if you want to get a, a gene or a vector to this cell, sometimes the problem is it likes to go to that cell, sort of maybe like your kids. Um, and you got to direct them to this cell. So, so, so the advantage, one of the strategy is to determine where else it likes to go and to quote unquote detarget that. That, any incremental advance in that is going to require a different vector. And so the, what we've talked to the community about is, um, you know, if we saw that there was a better technology that could get into all cells and was safe, um, we should talk about it, about whether to proceed with the trial that we're proceeding with. But, but, we, uh, but uh, our proposal is that, um, that as long as we could benefit from all the other experience with this approach, um, let's, uh, let's go forward to maximize safety and, and, and to see, uh, you know, see what the result is. But we'll constantly be evaluating that question. Is there something better? Is there something better? And then pivot if we need to pivot. But we may not need to pivot. And rather than perfect being the enemy of the good, we thought we would just, uh, you know, with the support of the community, go forward with what we're doing. Yeah, James, thank you. Thank you for your talk here. Um, I was just wondering, are some recent evidence that there, has, there is altered flow of the spinal fluid in neurodevelopmental diseases? There are some emerging evidence about this. Is this important? of importance for the delivery of the viral um, vector into the spinal fluid, this potential alteration of the flow 
or the spinal fluid? Is this something that we have to take into consideration? I guess my question is, do we need to test the delivery of the vector in an animal model? And in this case, for example, the pig can be a good model for this before going into the clinical trials. Yeah, and, um, it's, it's a good question in that it relates to the sort of the, the uh, performance of delivery as a function of the disease. Yeah. And, um, and so um, the other part of that is uh, the biology of the species as it relates to delivery. So how likely is it that delivery will be the same between a mouse, a pig, a cat, a dog, a monkey, and a human? Our experience with pigs is you get much better distribution in pigs than you get with, with primates. That's been our experience. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't feel comfortable using the performance of a vector in a pig as a gate to go into the clinical trial. It's not, because you have to balance the underlying disease versus the, the, the species specific impact. Receptors are different and other things like that. But, but if we had a monkey disease uh, of, the, of the model, that may be helpful. And, and I'm not encouraging us to wait for a monkey model before we proceed forward. They breed once a year, only four months, and they only have one in their litter. So it would be 20 years before we'd have enough monkeys probably to do it, do the experiment. 